have for discussion. One of the important things about today is to actually get the, the chance to hear these um, the thoughts and to actually think about what this means for us and to have some discussion. So certainly there's, there's an hour for discussion and for questions. And if, there, if it's a question that's specific to your area, um, I'll just jot it down on the board because we might want to deal with that this afternoon because otherwise we might end up covering off um, two things at the same time sort of thing. Um, but it would be better to, to hold it to this afternoon. But really the focus this morning is around the, the national and um, sort of sub-national, I suppose, level of issues. And yeah, certainly um, there was a couple of slides in particular that we may want to jump back that really caught my attention, at least. So just to, just to kick off, um, actually, you know, one area, and I'm, I'm going to break my rules right from the start, one of the interesting areas that I found in terms of probably a bit of a paradox is Gisborne, in that they had a pop, they were population decline, but then at the same time, they had a very low percentage of the plus 65s. So you able to, yes. it seemed like a bit of a paradox, that one. It's the, it's the um, very deep-waisted age structure. You know, you'll, you'll see some of them this afternoon. Some of those age structures, they look absolutely like hourglasses. It's because all of the young middle sort of population is at 20 to 39 has gone. And that, um, that means that the net migration loss overwhelms the natural increase that they're getting. And that's the other thing, with these regions, when they lose that, that what I call the reproductive potential of those people in that age group, um, you know, it, it just has such long-term implications for those regions. You, you can see a hole in an age structure like that, it doesn't, unless you have massive migration gains of specific ages into those areas to fill that hole up, like targeted migration almost, <laughs> Um, you never get rid of those holes. They stay in the age structure. And you can see it like in the China, China's age structure, for example, from the, the Great Leap Forward. Um, there's a bite in the age structure which is now around about um, 55 years of age where there were a lot of deaths. Um, the other questions I had related to, um, to the labour market. Well, we might pick that up Okay, when I, the presentation I did, obviously I, I was painting a picture of a New Zealand's a, a great place to come to and live in, and um, yeah, it, it really our migration is only restricted by how many people we let in to some extent because we're in, in that bracket. But but how that relates to this, I'm sure you get this question quite a lot. The, the information you presented, people say, well, how changeable is it? How how determined is these trends that you're, you're presenting on, are they irreversible, there's no change, or are they, uh, are they, is there still potential that could be changed? Um. Well, if you look at the, if you look across the developed world, I know we <laughs> don't use that term, but the, the more developed countries then, those trends are so advanced that for us, we are like the last cab off the rank. When you're the youngest, um, there are advantages that we are gaining at the moment, but our challenge is bigger because, because we're coming off the rank last and there's not that pull of, for us to just keep um, drilling into. Yes, there's still, as I said, going to be a few billion more people on the planet. They will all be in the developing countries. If we want to bring them here, we have to, and, and this is another issue that, that is coming up for these countries. They don't want us to be cherry-picking their best and brightest. They've put a lot of effort into educating them and they need them there. Um, England took Malawi's entire nursing um, graduate class a couple of years ago. You know, that's the sort of thing those countries are saying that's not on, you know, you should have to pay for those people. Um, maybe we could do it by saying, yes, come here and we will put you through our education system. That might be one way, but these are these are the sort of things that we need to be talking about in the future. There will not be a huge number of highly skilled migrants, youthful highly skilled migrants, that New Zealand will want as this unfolds. So it, it will become more difficult. To expand that a little bit, um, we, we hear at times uh, you know, the, the theory about young New Zealanders, uh, I guess, post-university going overseas and then returning later. I've got a son and daughter-in-law with two recently born kids in Dubai and you know, hopefully they'll come back one day. And is that, is that going to 
have much real effect on what we're talking about? Is it, is it, you know, or is it all at the margin? Look, those projections already include nationally a net international migration gain of 12,000 a year, every year. We're currently, last year was minus 3,000. Um, the year before it was a plus about eight. The year that we're in at the moment looks like being more negative than last year. Um, we've got a bit to make up before we even sort of come back on stream. So in a way, your son's return has already been monitored, programmed into those projections. We have to get the net migration gain above 12,000 a year to seriously alter it. And what I'm saying is 12,000 a year every year is, is going to be difficult. Look, we might, we might have a bumper crop one year. We, we might have, you know, one, one year going back about 40 years ago, New Zealand had a net migration gain of about 38,000. It could happen again for one or two years, but our ability to actually do it in this tight, tightening context year on year, on year is just going to be difficult. And that, you saw the slide I had there with the, the how, to, how to grow your population to 15 million, what you would need to do to do it. So you, I think you can forget about the birth rate going up to three and a half births per woman. And my students tell me that's not on. <laughs> um, and, and I've surveyed every one of them for many years. Um, the migration is the only real scenario that we can do it through. And um, it would just be very difficult to get to, to, to get between four and eight times the highest average net migration gains that New Zealand has ever had. We got them in a time when migrants were, you know, we were paying for them to come here. We may have to go back to that. Um, and one of the other difficulties, of course, is finding suitable work for those people to encourage them to be here. Well, if you want a highly skilled, mm. advanced economy, you're looking for high skilled mm. labour. So, like I said, probably the best way forward would be bringing... Now, the, this is really a, an issue that's uh, it's quite important. I'm glad you raised it. The, the migrant um, targets, if you like, the government is, is targeting two-thirds of the migrants as skilled migrants. Skilled migrants don't have children. Um, they come to work and they have relatively low fertility rates like everybody else who's highly skilled and professional and so on. What we need is more a tempering of the migration components so that you bring in more family migrants. The children go to school, they get inculcated into the ways of the population, they train here and then they become the labour market of the future. So it's like looking at your migration program, instead of it being a quick fix, you have to have that longer view. Bring them in, help fill up our schools, need more teachers, bring them through, and they would eventually be the, be the um, workers that we need. That's, that's what was put forward, the argument that was put forward in Australia. Okay. And that's if I can speak from a, a personal perspective. I, mean, I come from, from South Africa. I came to New Zealand for a reason. It wasn't money, <coughs> mm -hmm. so it was no strong driver. It was because New Zealand was a destination of choice. Yes. Now, how do we encourage and continue to make New Zealand a destination of choice? I don't, I don't know the answer. I mean, that's bigger than demographers just count people <laughs> in and out. <laughs> they don't have a lot to do with it, but, but with, with um, those sort of things. But look, I know that that's the case. I mean, that's why so many British people also came here in the post-war years. New, Zealand has, New Zealand's got a wonderful reputation out there in the world. I think the important thing is that we don't sully it. I'm, I, I was actually quite surprised with some of the um, indicators that you were using, Ross, that, that showed us in a better light than perhaps I was aware of because we actually have a pretty bad reputation in terms of child poverty, for example, um, in terms of uh, certain levels of violence and things like that. So, uh, you know, there's, there's indicators that other people out there might not be aware of and maybe we've got to clean up them and that will keep people coming in. I don't know. I'm shocked to hear that because, I mean, specifically, one of the things we look at, and you go back to old Maslow's diagram, you look right at the bottom end, a lot of people are leaving first world countries because safety is no longer there. 
we come to New Zealand because we perceive this as utopia. This is safe. Yeah. It's relatively safe. you feel safe. that there's statistics showing yeah. that this is actually not a safe society. I find that odd. Okay, well, we, we, have, we are 27th out of the OECD countries for child poverty. Uh, it's an indictable level for a, a developed, a highly developed country like New Zealand to be in. We're only we're third from the top with our 65 plus poverty levels. I mean, we have almost no poverty at 65 plus, but we have high levels of poverty in our children, and it's borne out in many of the rural areas. And um, you know, I there are a number of my colleagues. I mean, that's not my patch. I just on the fringes of that, but there's a, a you know, poverty action, child poverty action group, for example, is a, a very important group that's um, constantly lobbying government about these issues. It depends the extent to which people outside New Zealand do know about those things. But there's, there's, there are levels of, there are levels of things in New Zealand that some people are, do pick up on, like, um, you know, New Zealand doesn't have a wonderful safety record in, in many of its um, industries, you know, that, again, look, I'm, I'm sort of, I'm, I'm, I'm moving more into anecdotal evidence here, so I should stay away from it, but I think trying to, you know, keep our image up out there and actually fix up some of our problems at home would be a way to keep people coming. So there are things we could do, isn't it, that make New a more attractive destination. There's our focus. One of the questions... We're doing a lot better than Democratic Republican Congo. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I, suspect, well, I suspect our health and safety record is a... Is a bit of here. Um, one of the questions that I would ask earlier was, what, talking about the population burden and the changes from, from um, group to group, the, the gender balance as well, what uh, impact does that have? Obviously, a lot of this is around fertility rates. If, um, if there's an imbalance, uh, what impact does that have in internationally your experience? Oh, well, it, ha it, it has some huge impacts internationally, like China, for example. Mm -hmm. The sex ratio at birth is about 118 males to 100 females, and um, that's apparently it's come down a wee bit now, but who knows about the statistics, really. But there are... There are uh, very large numbers in the, million, uh, in the hundreds of millions of uh, young Chinese males who are now approaching marriageable partnering ages who won't be able to find a partner. And there, I mean, again, we were talking about this, there's, there's all sorts of dreadful social tensions and, uh, you know, bad things happening in those countries. It's not just China, it's uh, there's areas of India, um, Lots of other countries as well have where there's a very strong sun preference and uh, you don't just have to have a one-child policy, but where you've got sun preference and where people are only having one or two children, they opt to have the boy. Uh, so that <coughs> alters things. Um, so New Zealand, that balance is still... Different. It's not too bad. Look, I, I've, I've read the... Um, uh, what is it? My colleague in Australia calls it um, the man drought. <laughs> but actually, you know, females tend to partner males that are sort of a year to three or four years older than them and if you look at the adjacent age groups it's, it's actually not too bad but in some of your areas yeah um, in some of the rural areas for example you've got quite a an excess of young males and a, a deficit of young females um, but I'm sure they'll find each other you know <laughs> it's about how do you encourage the young women to go out on the farm um, those those can be a problem. Those things can be a problem. Got a solution to it. Yeah. Yeah. They need to get haircuts first. They need to get haircuts first. Set the girls at the bar. It may be a wash. Yeah. 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 Um, but but in terms of just picking on that, in terms of, in terms of our overall demography and um, and reproduction rates, they are, they are in line with norms, effectively, we're not out of kilter with anybody in that regard. Well, we have the highest birth rate in the developed world. We're doing something right. So is, <laughs> um, that, is that Polynesian, though, particularly? Uh, the striving out? Or? No, no, well, it's more the Māori population. Mm -hmm. um, but again, because you've got a very youthful Māori population, you know, half of them under the age of 23, so that, that, that population is, is going to, like, they account for, Māori account for about 20% of the population uh, 0 to 19. They account for about, um, 
there's about 24%, about a quarter of the births. But of course, you know, you've got the multiple ethnic count as well to deal with, so it's sort of fuzzy at the edges. But the youthfulness of the Māori population, slightly higher birth rate, uh, means that they make a ma quite an impact on the overall fertility rate. Like that's the primary reason for New Zealand's fertility rate being high. But to get it up much higher would be, you know, if you think about it, an average of 2.1 births for every woman in the country in this day and age is actually getting quite a big ask. And I used to, I used to tell my class that, you know, I was one of three and born in the baby boom. So it means that and the peak birth rate here was 4.2. So my mother made somebody else have another child. Somebody else had to have their 4.2 plus one for my mother to make up, you know. So you, you, know, you think about it in terms of trying to get an average birth rate of 2.1 for every woman in the country when you've got 20% not having any children and the leaving it too late is a, is a, a real issue. Um, people having their children at, at 30 plus, which were ages that, you know, when I was young, we were told you didn't have children at those ages because it was there were all sorts of problems for genetic problems and so on. Um, I think we're actually doing pretty well on the birth rate, birth stakes. Oh, but what I was going to say before, one of the things is when you've got a big bite in your age structure, even if you've got your birth rate per woman up, you won't get, you know, if you haven't got sufficient mums and dads to have them, you won't get the impact at the base. And that's what happens in these, in these regions where you've got real deeply hollowed out age structures. You can just about recognise the people in some of those age groups. And, um, and so even if you might have a birth rate of 2.3 or 4 in some of the rural areas, on average you still haven't got enough mums and dads to make the birth cohort very big. The bulk is just not there. No. But what I'm interested in, and um, you'll see it this afternoon, looking at using that uh, forensic demography approach, you can see in most of your regions here, most of your TAs do actually get sizeable uh, inflows, net inflows of people, parental age people and children. So those bites, which I normally look at the age structure and see a bite and go, oh, that's net out migration of young. Actually, in many cases, it's not, has been, but it's augmented by an, a net gain above them and below them. And it makes the bite look worse, not because so many young ones have gone, but because you've got more coming in at certain age groups. You'll see that this afternoon. Yeah, I think also that um, did show up on that, on that chart too. Yeah, it did. The, um, mm. um, Do you want me to? Just that there was the, the graph that showed the, the migration yeah, um, through the age groups. Right, yeah. Just um, while we're finding that Maori migration, I was reading um, Michael King, is it the history of New Zealand on a plane to, to yes. the US or something like that ages ago, and it was oh, like 12 it was. hours of reading, so I got through it. And, and a figure I never realised, Ngāi Tahu in 1900, so this South Island, down to 2,000 population. And you think about if you were a wider family, which they are, and your family on the earth is down to 2,000, the message is going to be quite different from the message we got <laughs> when we were kids. It's like, get out there and have kids, Go or we disappear. And so, you know, Naito is about 27,000 now, I think, is the number. So they've obviously done reasonably well on that, that objective. But there's a reason for Maori fertility. They got so hammered um, sort of in the late 1800s and early 1900s that, that you know, they, they just decided they needed to uh, they have bigger families to survive on, on the face of the earth as, as a people, and that's, that's still throwing up now. So. And also, when larger numbers of your babies die, um, mm. there's no incentive to have fewer of them. So it's, it's, we always see that, you know, once you get control over infant child mortality, your birth rate comes oh, down oh. dramatically. So in a way, that's our gap that we were speaking about before. Well, in that case, yeah, for, for Timaru, there's a net loss at at uh, 20 to 24 mainly, but a little gain at the young children <coughs> ages and the parental ages. And it's just, it's always interesting, you know, you can, I have a program that I just click the button and you can see what it does to an area, but they do differ vastly, like, you know, I mentioned before, Tam Thames Coromandel, it gets this big increase at about um, 50 to 65 years of age, it's huge. Um, and, and a net outflow at young adult ages. 
So this is hopefully your kids coming back here. So mm. is that what we're talking about? <laughs> and that's that's another issue too. It's like I, too, I also have a, a kid living in um, Melbourne with a child over there, and they won't come home um, because she is Australian. The young, my granddaughter, seven years old now, she's Australian. They don't want to come here. There's no reason why they would want to come here except for their mother, <laughs> for the grandmother. Um, you know, business is good over there. Uh, lots of young people when they go overseas at those ages they partner up and they don't come back and it is it's harder that's another thing that migration policy needs to take on board is that you're not trying to get back one person you're trying to bring back two and they both need jobs and and you know some of our policies don't exactly allow um, say husbands and wives to work in the same organization you know things like that so so if young people go off on the and come back to partner, Ah, that's going to um, boost us up a bit? Well, I've been counted in. <laughs> but <laughs> totally been but that's, in. that's actually what has happened. <laughs> so that's not a projection. Yes. I could do it forward, but all I'd be showing is what the assumptions are. Um, Brian, you were thinking... Yeah, I had a sort of a very broad and historical question. Uh, just thinking about one of the first slides there with the, the, decline, of, of the decline of the growth rate and the level of 9 billion. And going back to the 14th century, where we had the Black Death and the plague in Europe. And I guess that was another place when they lost a quarter or a third of their population. Has anybody studies done on the demography of that and what was the ramifications there? We've heard about that labour mm. became a lot more expensive and peasants became middle class and there was that different relationship between labour and capital. Mm. Could the same thing start to happen here? Those who've got the capital, we haven't got the labour, we've still got uh, the whip, whip hand. <laughs> You're not planning on leaving any viruses loose or anything, are you? <laughs> no, no. So you, are you suggesting we've actually been there before? We have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 We have. Well, look, I, I, I can't answer about the um, economic impacts of it, but you can only imagine them. Uh, a third of the European population died in that plague. Yeah. What's staggering, and I think it's important to remember, they died over a six-week period. Can you imagine what that would be like? When we talk about bird flus and, you know, and think about how fast things move around the world these days, but that, that started around about Spain somewhere, and you see it goes up and fans across Europe over a, about, uh, about eight months it took to get the, over the whole period, but in each area it went through over a matter of weeks and just left behind in its wake just, you know, a third of the population dead. Now, that's going to grind your economy to a halt. Can you just imagine? I mean, who you would just give up. Now, we shouldn't go down that track, but you would just give up trying to bury people and your, your economy would just stop because there would be, everything else would be, um, I mean, you, you think well, about well, what happened in Christchurch when you had... The, of the effects, because all of a sudden <coughs> people who were serfs before yep. because there was you know, a surplus of labour actually became people mm. that started the middle class and had a bit of wherewithal, mm. and then capital became important as well. So mm. I'm just trying to think of that from the modern terms. I mean, China might be losing people or leveling off, but they've got the capital. <laughs> That's right. I don't know if we've got it either, but... <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, it's, it's a, a really interesting area, but it's not one that I... No, nobody's done any studies on it from a oh, demography yes. point of view? Um, yes, uh, Jared Diamond, Guns, Germs and Steel is a really good book on it. Um, there's quite a lot of work has been done on it, but it's a bit outside my patch, so I... It's historical demography and it's absolutely fascinating. Yeah. Oh, David, you've got a Sorry, it's the same topic. I just want to expand on that and say we don't have to go that far back. I mean, world wars would have had the same sort yes. of impact there. You would have seen the same impact on, on the economy of, of the world post, post the wars. Absolutely. The, um, uh, coming back, the influenza epidemic, um, you see it uh, sort of come home with the armed forces, arrives in Australia and then it arrives in New Zealand. I can't remember what the death toll was I, I won't even hazard There's a guess. More people um, killed by that than but the first world war. Th that's right. Yeah, the, yeah. It yeah. was really yeah. huge, and um, again, you see the impact on the population. Another one my predecessor Ian Paul looked at was the um, impact on the Māori, of the Māori battalion losses on the Māori population. And you go back, you know, if you're interested in that historical stuff, for some regions they they lost their essentially reproductive base. No, 
in the Maori Queen at the time opposed the formation of for, for that very reason. She said, we can't stand the loss of men, uh, mm. keeping a, a battalion supply, um, don't have enough guys. And there was a huge stout between her and the and Whainui and the government, and, um, and, and the government, and it was actually, you know, Ngāti Parau and other ones, but there were very few Whainui in, in the Maori family as a result of that, so. The silver lining, we did recover afterwards. We did survive. Well, well, we don't understand the trend here. It doesn't yeah. look good, and there is doom and gloom, but there has to be success afterwards. Well, I, you see, I don't know whether it is doom and gloom. I, I actually think, if, if you could just take your mind a hundred years ahead and think, well, all of the clamouring to stop the world's growth that everybody's been talking about, it's actually happened. It's happened. So it's got to have some potentially good environmental impacts. Getting from this point to that point is where the pressure is going to come on. And my colleagues working in Japan have shown that that the ending of growth and the extreme ageing of a lot of the regions is associated with an increase in energy demand and an increase in environmental impact because the older population uses different types of, well, has different types of energy demand. Um, you know, I, I don't know it all sort of in detail, but it's, it, again, this is work that is cutting edge, needs to be done. and. Um, they actually weren't funded. You know, they've done, the, as we all do, we do a bit of this work in our weekends, um, but they, they put forward, like we do here, grant application that wasn't funded. But it's mm. where we do need to look, what are the impacts of ageing and the ending of growth and onset of depopulation on environmental pressures and energy demand? And actually, if any of you are, that is your patch, um, I was presenting in Queensland once, uh, several years ago now, so I'm sure people have got more understanding about population ageing, but we had a, a gentleman came up to me and said, look, um, we've been for Queensland projecting um, energy demand and we've been doing a type of linear projection. So, you know, the population's grown by 2%, 2%, 2%, we project it forward like that. But what you're showing there is that the growth is going to be at the older ages and the older people are the ones who use the air conditioners. I'm going back to my office to, you know, add in some age-weighted projections and, um, I can only imagine that it would have made a huge impact. And again, I mentioned earlier boat moorings. <laughs> I'm changing the subject entirely, but another guy I was running a workshop and he said, gosh, you know, we've got X number of boat moorings and we've been projecting so many more, but actually who owns boats that have moorings? <laughs> They're all 45 plus, so we need to add in an age-weighted projection. So well, anything that you do, you do need to do an age-weighted projection. Probably an interesting one for us when we're in Central Tarnia. We have a thing of retired people who yep. stand, stand around all day water in their garden. Yep. <laughs> yes. So I imagine that, that actually is an issue that's impacted by that balance. Yeah, it's, it's, it's one of the issues we've, I guess, we've had to grapple just recently with the installation of water meters um, to actually curb that demand. Um, it has it's taken the peak, the top of the peak off, but um, it's still the demand's still quite high, and so. Yeah, they, they do like their gardens. Indeed. And, and the biggest topic at the moment is um, a, a green verges or brown verges. That's, you know, that, that's how, that's their main concern at the moment. Mm. Or mobility scooter access to crop paths. Well, now that's one. Yeah. That's a huge one because if, if you, you know, a lot of, um, especially the smaller towns, you've got uh, power poles growing up out of yep. footpaths or the footpaths have gone around the power pole. And, um, you know, you could be looking, well, not so much as in Australia, but litigation for people, little scooters going off and breaking their hip and so on, you know, it's these, these things have to be thought it's about. It's really changing the face of what the footpath was originally designed for. Yes, so that's right. So now it's becoming a combined cycle mobility, you know, do we get rid of one of the traffic lanes and create a bigger footpath? Well, there you go. Yeah. So that is the sort of thing, you know, again, to go back to the point that it was Victoria, the guy from Victoria said, well, we're projecting another... Uh, half a million people over the next 30 years, but if they're all going to be, was well, about 80% of them are going to be at 65 plus, do we do a whole new peak hour transport system or do we build a age friendly transport system? And you know, that's where I sort of got that line from really, and it was like, yes, you do. Yeah. Um, but again, I, I'd sort of just like to momentarily mention the positive sides of it because there are things that we haven't even tried, like we talk about how we're going to get 
older rate payers who want rates discounts to go along with you know, the fact that they're going to have to have rate increases or something. But we haven't even tried the, um, the sort of uh, philanthropic approach, for example. What have you said to your community? Look, folks, this is all the growth we're ever going to have. You want a new community hall. Um, what say you all put $1,000 in or whatever? You know, to what extent do we try that sort of thing in New Zealand? I know it's been done in pockets of uh, South Australia, for example, and very successfully. Um, I'm yeah, sure that you had a battle <laughs> Have you got an hour? <laughs> <laughs> no. we, we, did, we did try that here, briefly, so everyone knows. You did? Yeah, absolutely. Total project fees, everything is 23 and a half, yeah? Yes. And <clears throat> we set a target of 8 to 9 million to be raised from non-council sources. Hired some really good people, had really good strategies, and we, we actually achieved 7 million. That's marvellous. Right. It is, and, and that includes you know, gaming trusts and the like, government, but substantial local input from businesses and, and individuals. Hmm. And it's, but it was a real challenge, though, for people to understand that this wasn't what was normally done. That's you right. Know, council provides these things, persuading them that, in fact, if you wanted something really good, in fact, it was more than just what council could do. That's and right. It, it, but it's, it's really hard work. It, I can imagine it would be huge, but it's the conversation that, again, has to be just slowly, slowly got out there into the community so that people realise well, if our populations aren't going to grow anymore into the future and we want these things, we actually will need to come to the party. And, you know, each, you look at the baby boomer wave, it is better off than its predecessors, more tuned to doing different things. Mm. Well, well I, I'd love to, for us, if we could, to talk about that for a few minutes, about the, the level of service and the expectation of these people, uh, you know, all of us, as we get older. I'll give you an example. We have, we have a great aquatic centre here. We had an old pool, covered pool, that was out of the art, and, at the, and we, we offer over 80s free entry. Right. At the old pool, I think we had five on the list. Right now, in this facility, we are nearly at 100. Right? Right. And I'm, I don't know if it's free that's causing these people to come in, but there's a fair chance it is because it's you know, no charge, or if it's the facility. But we've had, we have built in here a number of facilities for that older demographic. We've got uh, ramp into the program pool and, and the like, a whole lot of that sort of stuff. But the, you know, the expectation is really high about you know, that it is for this demographic because they, they have time on their hands, they can come here, uh, they're usually well versed, uh, and they have deep pockets, unfortunately. Well, and short arms. And their numbers, <laughs> <laughs> and their numbers are going to quadruple. See, I'm yes. start charging them. <laughs> well, but, but there are some people that say, why can't we give these people the gold card? Because that's what government does. Uh, and we give them a gold card, and I'm thinking the over 65 gold card, well, we might as well not charge anybody. Uh, yeah. well, that's well, those exactly. numbers, that's going to kill you, isn't <laughs> yeah. it? So, yeah. so actually, can I just clarify, so that's over 80s? Over 80. So this is this group here, but of course there'll be plenty of people in the community who think that should be that here, shall we? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And that's a very large chunk. Mm. Absolutely. I mean, I, I'm loving the data that's here, uh, because for further debate at Council, which I'm sure is, is not far away, then some of these numbers that you know, we'll be able to use this to actually show what the impact will be on our revenue stream. Hmm. But, but the level of service expectation, you know, and I'd love some discussion around that, hear what others have got to say, it, it, it's climbing all the time. Yes. And, and affordability for that higher expectation is really hard. Um, actually, I'll talk to Richard because certainly you've got some issues in Waitaki with that right. population change. Well, we're probably a little bit slightly ahead of the curve compared with some other communities in terms of our age structure. And Natalie was talking previously about um, age-weighted projections, but there's, there's almost a need for some research around age-weighted service expectations. Yeah. To, which is, hmm. maybe places like Waitaki that are a little bit ahead of the curve are, are good places to to try and do some of that research to understand what the person who's 65 to 70 expects compared with what the person is who's 35 or 45 or, or whatever. It's not going to go away, is it? It's certainly not going to go away. But while we're talking about that, um, when, I, when I engaged um, Natalie to come down and talk to us, I said, now, do you do work for individual councils? I'm just going to do a little commercial for Natalie here. And the answer was, yes, she does and yes, she has. Um, so if you if you like what you see, I mean this is not about selling Natalie's services today, but she is available and her team are available to do quite specific work for individual councils, part of her remit. Um, so 
have that conversation over lunch or, or before she leaves if you want to, or, or um, I can give you her contact details. So. And uh, certainly commenting on that, Ross, I mean, that was the first time I came across some of the work that had been done as well, with regard to South Waikato, where they're in a situation where it pretty much was doom and gloom, really, from um, Stats New Zealand's perspective. No matter which um, projection you chose, it wasn't a particularly positive one. Um, but then at the same time, the council was trying was trying to actively be involved in the labour market and to really get that economy going. So they're wanting to determine at that stage, well, what does that actually mean for us? So you were able to do some work in that, in that area to, to, um, to yes. try and apply some logic to that. But, you know, they've, they've, they've got a number of sort of economic innovations going on, uh, including, um, well, putting pine tree land back into farming and that sort of thing. But at the end of the day, it doesn't make a huge impact on your population. Uh, you, you're talking, maybe count another 200 people in. What age are they? What will be their fertility rate? Um, will they stay? Will they add to the numbers? Will they replace themselves? All of those things. It doesn't actually really change the, the overall um, picture greatly. So doing those things shouldn't be about trying to really grow your population as such as as much as I think it's about trying to now achieve uh, stopping your population declining too fast. If, you, if your population declines a bit, that might actually be a good thing in some areas, but you don't want it to happen really, really fast. You know, you, as I always say to people, um, well, you know, you like having a rubbish collection, don't you? And you like street lights and you like your footpaths safe and all that. Those things you, you would be the things that have to go if your population declines too fast because you wouldn't be able to sustain them. So it's about, first I think it's really important not to promise ongoing growth, population growth. Well, you people don't do that, but politicians do. You know, we will keep this population growing. Um, it's not really going to be possible. And second is to try and achieve a, a sustainable population by knowing what the drivers of your local population change are, because they're different. You can see they differ for each different region. Um, and targeting things that each of the particular demographics need uh, just you, you would know Dale Williams, I imagine, from the Mayor's Task Force, and um, no, not, not too many people know him here, but he's going around a, a lot of, he's the Mayor of Otrahonga, or has been, he's just stepping down. Um, so he's been talking to a lot of the people in the region saying, well, you know, it, where are you going to get your future labour force, you know, an engineering, an engineering firm, where are you going to get your future labour force when there aren't going to be any kids here? So. How about taking on one or two, you know, after school jobs, bring them on bit by bit and so on. It's worked. They have no unemployment in Otrahonga. Similar one, I heard um, the Mayor of Kutha District speaking on the radio mm. uh, about a month ago and they had a similar program and it was based on would you give your, your mates kid a job? And of course, if, if you are, they ask that question, you know, would I give my mates kid a job? Of course I would, you know, it's the natural response. So they built on that approach and they, their objective was to actually have the concern was around the unemployment rate, the 18 to 25, and they said, well, if that's what you would say, we'll put your money where your mouth is. And the story that I heard over the radio from the mayor explaining this was they actually had something like 80 young people in the program, and the deal was that if they got through that program, there was a job for, it, for them at the end of it. It wasn't go to a program and see what happens, it was the community is actually committed to jobs for these people at the end, and yeah, they have, they, their objective is to, um, is to re you know, completely remove that, that issue. They had areas, I think the issue they had was the likes of Lawrence, places like that, that just actually have got so many people leaving those areas that people who, um, are just constantly advertising for um, vacancies because there's nobody there. Um, and as I said, the, the population actually wasn't there in the first place. They, in the year, the migration from those areas, and they were, they were really struggling. So, you know, they've actively changed something that's happening. Mm. That's if, if you take on someone and you invest in them, training them, get them up to speed, they're going to be very much of interest to other organisations. You have to have that like staying on conversation rather than, you know, when can we get rid of you? And it's, you know, we're right on the cusp of it. As I think we were talking just in the break before. What I'm talking about is gathering speed as we speak and you will see it over the next five years. Um, the first of the baby boomers only started turning 65 last year. So these are, and, and that um, youth deficit is only going to bite 
in, as we go into this next five years. We're already into it. But that, those two coming together, the first wave of retirements and the deficit of youth coming together, um, will you know, see that tight situation happen. And uh, we, did, we did some projections, some economist colleagues and I, we correlated the rate at which the entry-exit ratio for each territorial authority fell, so the ratio of young availability uh, to people in the retirement zone, and the unemployment rate, the rate at which it had been changing. And we got almost perfect correlations. The rate at which the entry-exit ratio fell was the unemployment rate fell at the same rate. And older age employment, the 64, 65 plus employment and the 15 to 19 year employment went up by the same rate. And Marlborough, Tasman, Tasman, Marlborough, what's the other one I'm looking for? Nelson. Nelson. <laughs> Father came from Nelson. Um, they that uh, was that had the strongest correlation, 100% correlation. Now, we did it looking through from about the 1980s, um, but when we looked at 2000 and got past 2006, the correlations weakened because of the um, economic crisis from 2008. But it was saying that when you don't have an economic crisis, you're that the, your labour supply and the tightening of your labour market is correlated with a greatly improved unemployment situation. I think it's a, you know, it was a crude type of analysis, but it was, it gives you a tantalising insight into what could be in the future when you don't have sufficient labour supply, you can expect most of them to be employed. And a drop in crime. Hmm? And a drop in crime. I, uh, supervised a PhD on this in Australia and we looked at the correlation between the crime rate and population ageing and uh, found very strong influences. So the demographic that commits most of the observable crime uh, um, is of course the young population and as it diminishes and as jobs, uh, as they, more of them are in jobs, you, you get this diminish, uh, impact on the crime rate. It was, it was a fascinating study. Yeah, I picked up two things in your presentation. One was the, the Auckland situation where it, there's a young population and they're certainly getting the lion's share of migration. I think there's really migration is still going to be a battle for us. It's going to Auckland. But you also commented that this um, demographic change is not on the government's agenda. Is there a connection there, the fact that Auckland has more votes than anywhere else in New Zealand. <laughs> the government is, is effectively clouded by that issue. Look, it's it's definitely on the government's agenda, but in but not the not really the regionality of it. So you know, at the moment, there's this engagement with, uh, despite what John Key says about not putting up the age of eligibility for the pension, there's clearly um, interest in doing so, and so they're exploring those sort of avenues. But it's a national level look at it. You know, um, is that national level influenced by Auckland? Yeah, well it, well it is. I, I gave a presentation in Auckland uh, late last year called um, A Tale of Two Futures, Auckland and the Rest. Yeah. Uh, and you'll see in the slide this afternoon, Auckland currently takes about 55% uh, of the population growth, share of population growth. That's expected to go up to almost 70% over the next few years. And uh, Otago is, uh, sorry, um, Canterbury is one of the four regions that really has any significant growth, but it pales into insignificance. You know, you've got 70% up here for Auckland, and the rest of it shared across the rest of the regions, of which Waikato, Bay of Plenty, and uh, Canterbury, a little bit for Wellington, get the majority. From a planning perspective, Peter, I think um, one of the issues we face, the housing affordability issue, is one of you know, the pressure for like, the government's likely to put on councils to try and do something about that, but at the same time, if that's all predominantly happening in one region. It's well, it's really something that I personally think about because, you know, interest rates surely must be set by the demand that's going on in places like Auckland. And, you know, we out there in the country have got to pay those interest rates. Just think about from the, from the planners that he perspective. Well, the, the, the whole housing affordability argument is, is driven a bit by Auckland because it's skewing the average out mm. disproportionately. 
Um, I, I don't know where all things going to go because physically there's only so much room there. Are mm -hmm. they going to split up in the north one or are going to split Yeah, or go up. Yeah, so the yeah. 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 the, the recent yeah. correspondence from the council, from the government, does seem to suggest that that is part of it, isn't it? That, that it does seem to be Auckland centric. A lot of us, mm -hmm. the information that's coming in, there's specific targets and goals and, and strategies for. Development, mm -hmm. development contribution discussion. Mm -hmm. Supporting papers around that are very Auckland centric. I'm the queue with two questions, Andrew. So just wanted to check. No, it's all I'm the new. Yeah, I just wanted to go back to <coughs> an earlier conversation uh, around expectations, the levels of service, and the uh, aging population. Um, I know in our council, um, I think there's quite a bit of a culture shift going to be needed because our discussion is always around um, the retired population can't afford to make to pay for these things because they're on their fixed incomes, and that's a, a um, argument that's used pretty much on any on any discussion. And and the expectation is that the young population will pay for it because the the, the the retired have already retired, they've paid their dues and now owed, owed the increased level of service actually we were talking about before um, because they've, they've been there and done that. But that, that's actually from what you're saying is incorrect because it's the, well, the retired population does have the money and it's the population coming through that doesn't. And so um, there's a whole culture change, mm -hmm. that, if you're right, what I've picked up, a whole culture change required that it's actually the, we've got to get money out of that retired population to fund the younger population because that's where the poverty is. It's that ethos of we've already paid our way now it's their turn. Yeah, yeah. To a certain extent. As we go through the cycle. I think they have. No. Well, they may have. When you talk about who built the infrastructure, the national government, you know, built the infrastructure through the works of Parkland. We've only just recently started depreciating the asset for the replacement. So in between of it being built, somebody's consumed that. And it is that ageing population. So. And they're the very same people that haven't contributed to their own superannuation, Correct. government superannuation, we're all paying for that now. So, and yeah. we're paying for our own. But it is a difficult, given that yeah. they're on a fixed income. But, that's but, a but, I, think, but I think the reality of it is now, that excuse has been used mm -hmm. in 10 years' time. Yeah. That's simply, you Look, can't do anything else, can you? Yeah. There's, there's an... Uh, well, well, someone's yeah. still got to pay for it. Yeah. But, you know, it's not, the problem's not going to go away. No. Mm -hmm. There's, no, no. There, th this is a, a issue very dear to my heart. <laughs> but, um, you know, there's just a burgeoning uh, literature that shows that government is well aware of the relative wealth of the older population. So, first, it's important that it's, it's understood it's rel the older population and the forthcoming older population are wealthier than their parents and their predecessors. But not, um, it's not even, like, there's always there's pockets of um, people with no uh, ability to support themselves in old age and all the rest of it. But I've, I've just been staggered because, you know, I, I didn't think the literature would be that huge and I ended up having to do this review of it, <laughs> which really shocked me. And just paper after paper after paper um, from government, from Treasury, sh talks about the wealth, the relative wealth of the older population. What my concern is that if there isn't a change in the way we look at those things, um, there's what they call a fertility taxa taxation spiral. So if you put it, if you load up the younger population, if, if you've got a trebling of your older population coming up, you've either got to increase the taxation or reduce the service, reduce the goods and services that people get. So at the moment, the argument is they'll be going with the mostly with the goods and services that older people expect and increasing taxation in different ways. If you increase the tax rate on younger people, they will have fewer children because they will have to keep working to keep the household income up. And so on, on the one hand, you're trying to respond to population ageing, and on the other, you will drive it, you will accelerate it. And well, they will that also impact the, um, the migration loss? Yeah. And that there will be young people who would say, oh, I'm better to go to Australia. Well, all of back. those things, that's right. I mean, that's what people mm. say. But then actually, the numbers actually show that's one of the reasons the cause that. Well, we don't have, um, we don't interview people for the reasons like that. We just assume they often go over because they, you know, you're always, migration is always about being pushed and pulled. 
you might not have a job, you see something somewhere and you think you'll do better there, so you go. It's once you get there, um, if you succeed, then you're much less likely to come back these days. It used to be that you went for an OE, you know, and now you do, but you stay longer and then you're more likely to put down roots and it's more difficult to come back. So there's a good PhD student who's been studying a lot of the exit, um, exit interviews with people leaving the country and see what's actually going on. Well, there's so much that we need to know and um, that type of research is not funded. But actually, I, I must tell you, um, some colleagues and I, uh, we were funded last year in the Ministry of uh, Innovation and Business, MBE round, to do a study of the impact of demographic change on New Zealand's communities and one of the, uh, with two of the communities are Southland and Westland that are going to be looked at. So that's a, a two year funded project that myself, um, colleague Jacques Poot who's a population economist and uh, Peter um, Paul Spoonley from Massey University uh, where, and, a, and a couple of other people will be doing that work over the next two years and my role is pretty much to integrate all my databases so that we can break up that, for example, that net migration by whether we think it's international or <coughs> um, internal, uh, where did they go, um, who, you know, we, we can already show you like some of it, who, um, the gains in your areas, are they local or, uh, you know, from just locally or did they come from further away and that sort of thing. And that will help us piece together uh, a, a, a better mosaic, if you like, of what's really going on. But it's, it's trying to get money to do that type of research. It's, you know, <laughs> the, some of the grant rounds, you, you work for three or four weeks on a, on a proposal and um, then you get uh, one in ten gets to a second round and then only one in three gets funded. You know, it's like, it's, and so people are starting to go, well, I don't even know that I can afford the time to put the application in. And so for, for, for really uh, six or seven years now, there's been hardly any research done that would answer some of the questions that you would have. I just know that, except for the, the one on um, the wealth, the relative wealth of the older age population, there's not a lot of social research be, having been done because it's not been seen as important. So, so Natalie, that, the issue that Neil raised about, the, and, and Richard both from Waitaki, about the um, service level waiting against age, and, 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 which is something us as uh, you know, professionals working in the local government infrastructure sector and affordability of that, are you aware of any papers that are kicking around on that sort of stuff? That, that there's just not? Um, well, there are projections of, like national level projections of age weighted demand for things, but. Mm -hmm. Um, nothing that I've seen nothing at a regional, a regional level. level. Yeah. But then it's not difficult to do. I mean, I, I may have actually said to you I could have run a type of workshop which shows you how to do your own projections. Like, it's really relatively simple. When you're doing demand-based projections or supply, you actually just take something like Stats New Zealand's projections by age and you take your current age-specific usage rates, demand or whatever it is, um, hospital beds or whatever, you're not hospital people probably, uh, project it forward and you sum the bits for each age group and you get that age weighted projection and it really, really shows you uh, the powerful impact of ageing. Because if you just take a crude projection forward, if 2% if of your population has been doing something and you just project it forward at 2%, but if all that 2% was say at 45 to 60 years of age, as the wave moves through it, you get a huge impact. And likewise, you get a diminishing of things like, um, gosh, I've done projections for just about everything that moves, but I did some really interesting ones on movie attendance once. And so, you know, who goes to movies mostly? Well, in this particular area, it was young people. As you project it forward, you can just about close your movie theatres. <laughs> what, but what it says to you is don't close your movie theatres, see, see what your demographic is. And, and respond to it, and then you will keep your movie theatres open. A similar question came up last week, I was actually in high school, and the issue that came up there was about the requirement for different types of reserves, in particular neighbourhood reserves with playgrounds on them. And the question there was that we could, even, we could debate the, um, the point either way, in that did we need less playgrounds because of the change 
occurring, or did we need more because actually the grandparent, grandparents yeah. have more time with their children and they actually get more use than what they would with parents, particularly professional parents who are working. And we actually weren't able to come up with an answer to that question because and everyone's different. That's the, an example of the conundrum that you have. While you still have a family with kids, you could expect to be, be expected to provide a playground. Um, what do you do? You know, it's something that maybe you have to put it out to the people to say, what do we want? I, I know, I remember my first um, work really done with local government, so I was quite interested to hear about the whole issue of putting in a barbecue. So you think, people want a barbecue in this area, so you put in a barbecue. And the next minute it rains and you've got a puddle around it, so you have to concrete it. I'm sure you know what I'm getting at. And then before long they want to cover over it. And then they want to car park with it. And then, you know, it's like your barbecue that you all thought, yeah, let's put in a barbecue, you know, $1,000. It becomes like a $5,000 annual demand against you. <laughs> um, and, and so in the future, those decisions will have to be made. But it's like, uh, whose interests... Do you only respond to the older population and put in some more seats along the footpath um, and then all the young people disappear because they perceive the area not vibrant for them? Uh, it is going to be very difficult. One of the problems is communities don't think that far ahead. They're no. very much focused on today and how much they're paying. Mm. And um, you know, to think ahead and to think growth is extremely difficult. So when you say, you know, go out to your community, um, you're probably not going to get the answer you really need. Mm. I recently um, did some consultation with our communities around what they saw the water services, what their expectations of, of in the future, say in 20 years. The response I got back from the people that we had there was they weren't concerned about that because they wouldn't be here. Mm -hmm. yeah. And all their immediate, it was really it was their only immediate problem and um, around the pricing for with the cost of water. I just couldn't get past that. Yeah. Could, could I lead on from that a little bit? Um, is, it, is it fair to say that our, our national community doesn't know too much about this because it doesn't get much exposure? And would it be fair to say that that's because journalists write words and this is about numbers? Uh, I'll tell you one thing. It is very difficult to get this sort of information across in a two-second soundbite, right? I do a lot of media interviews. I, th I think I counted up the other day something like 350 media interviews in the last 10 years, all on this topic. And I usually the interview will maybe be, you know, between 5 and 15 minutes long, but if you see it on TV or you hear it on the radio or in the newspaper, it's like a sentence, um, a tiny bit, and I can't wave my arms around. <laughs> I can't get the whole context across because it's a big issue, and I suppose we all think our issue is big, but to try and explain why something's happening here, you've actually got to say, you know, the demographic transition that's been under, unfolding for 250 years has brought us to this point. They cut that bit out. Mm. Um, not just because it's numbers, but because it's, it's the, the context is so huge to try and get across. But I do think there are ways forward, and I've got a fabulous collection of old newspapers um, uh, from Tasmania, where I lived, and um, they used to have demographic information in them, and it talked about, you know, the local births and deaths and so on. But I had put it recently to the Waikato Times that why don't we run a little ticker tape thing across the paper like once a week or something, telling people what the population's doing and just slowly engage them with little issues. Um, somehow we have to get this information out to the general public so that they do understand that things, it's not about um, business as usual and the demands that we had in the past can't be delivered in the future. And, you know, as you know, councils get voted out when they say things like that, but they sort of need to all have that combined voice on it. And mm. well, I just don't think our community's got any traction with this stuff at all, really. Those pockets will know about it, mm. but generally as a, as a national community, it's just something that's too hard. I think it's even worse than that. Yeah. If you've got 30% or 25% of your population that are in that bracket where they are consumers of service but don't necessarily want to be payers, i.e. retired, 
a populist politician only needs to say, we'll extend the gold card to councils or whatever it is, and yep, by all of a sudden I'm, I'm in for, for a very long time, and your sustainability of your service delivery just goes down the, down the, down the flag hole at that point. So. Um, Ian, you have a question, then. I think William will talk about that. Yeah, just very quickly, I'll just say that, especially when some of the politicians perhaps are in that almost age bracket as well. No, I was just going to ask a quick question, uh, uh, going back to what you said before about um, some places like early on, it sort of struck a chord with me about Japan and places where they're talking about shutting down towns, and, and I guess did you say Denmark or places like that? Holland. 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 Mm. Um, Germany. Have they actually engaged their minds sort of nationally towards this? The governments, have they actually switched to that, to that focus? Very much so. Um, there, across all of Europe, there's a program called Age Management Planning. It's enshrined in parliamentary acts in some countries. And it's not, this is not about the housing issue. It's yes. about future yes. labour market, provision of the labour market and so on. Um, it's about requiring conversations to be had on people's transition to retirement intentions from fo age 45. Whereas, you know, in New Zealand, if you brought it up with your employer, you would be considered that to transgress age discrimination and so on. Um, I think all of Europe is, is geared up to this sort of thing. In fact, this young man from Holland the other day presenting to us, he said that, that there's no question about growing Holland's population. It's not what councils are trying to do or governments are trying to do. It's like, how do we now move forward? Um, so, at a national level and at an EU level, it is well understood. And I think that it would be useful for councils in New Zealand to um, either bring out someone or to look at what some of these other areas that are close to us in, in the way we have our I mean, it's a bit hard looking at the um, Scandinavian states, for example. You know, their welfare states and everything is so different to us. It's difficult. But to look at what some of these governments are actually doing, it is very much something that we have to deal with at a structural level and not just something that, you know, individuals, individual people or individual councils can do.